coming, I'm coming, Sherlock. I'm almost there. So, what's your problem this time? What are we doing in this wonderful conference? Well, you see, Watson, I'm really confused by developers. I looked at a few conference schedules, and it seems like they are only interested in latest technologies and trending frameworks. I don't see the problem. I mean, it seems logical to want to know more about the latest tech of your own job. Yes, but nobody is interested in the old stuff anymore. I mean, everyone's missing the, the greatest investigation of all time. Hmm, which one? HTTP cookies, of course. You know nothing, John Watson. Everybody's using them, but nobody really knows anymore how they are working, their behavior, their history, origin. It pushes developers to do lots of silly mistakes on web projects. And also, I realized, you know, the moguls, so non-IT people, have a profound lack of knowledge regarding tracking and privacy. So I asked Hubert Sablonier to investigate on this. Francais? Yes, but <clears throat> um, how do I say that? He, he looks a bit like us, doesn't he? And he's actually on the DevOx uh, poster. So I asked him to, to do a back-to-basics talk and really to insist on the facts, just the facts. That way, everybody, depending on, on their own context, professional and personal, should be able to detect some problems on their project and take the right decisions. Hmm, I'm intrigued. Hello, everyone. My name is Hubert Sablonier. I'm a web developer at Clever Cloud. Anyone knows Clever Cloud? Yeah, have you come by the booth? So basically, at Clever Cloud, we do IT automation. You write code, you do Git push, and we do the rest. So we have our own tooling on our clouds or on your premises. And um, while you're, when you do a Git push, we just build your application, we deploy it, we monitor it, we automatically rest restart the app if it crashes, and of course we maintain all the layers on which your code runs. So come see me at the end if you want more information. So today, I want to talk to you about my investigation on HTTP cookies. So I started to go back at the root, the origins of cookies. The year is 1994. And I got interested in that man, Lou Monturi. When you start to look at the history of the World Wide Web, you find, uh, you find articles by Tim Berners-Lee, Robert Cayo. But today I, like, I would like to, to honor Lee, Lou. You know, and to emphasize the impact he had on so many web technologies we are still uh, using nowadays. So here we go for the anecdotes. So back in 1994, Lou was working at Netscape, and with his colleagues, he participated in the setup of the second webcam of history. So back then, it was an Easter egg uh, accessible with Control-Alt-F, but it's still available online right now. So if I do refresh with the Wi-Fi, hoping it works or not, which is going to be a problem. But it's supposed to show you some fishes live. Anyway, should be. OK, we'll move on. What's nice is when you rehearse in your hotel room and the aquarium is showing the cleaning guy behind the aquarium. So anyway, it's sad that it's isn't working. We'll go back afterwards. I hope the demo won't fail, but anyway. So uh, Lou is also responsible for Lynx, which is actually a text-based browser. So for those who haven't uh, ever tried Lynx, so let's try maybe to go to DuckDuckGo, but if we don't have any internet connection, it's going to be a nightmare. Let me try again. Okay. So if, if you haven't, if you have never done a talk at DevOps UK in a, your foreign language, having a demo that fails in the first minutes, perfect thing for your stress. Okay. Let's continue. Anyway, so Lynx is a text-based browser when you have an internet connection working. Uh, a story about Lynx. Um, 
Lou was working during a so evening summer in 1994, and with his colleagues afterwards, they, they went to a bar, and they were discussing the future of the web and the possible extension of HTML they could add to Netscape. And Lou was sad. It was like, man, in, in um, links, there are so many stuff we won't be able to, to implement. I mean, the only thing we could do on all those you know, animations and stuff, the, the only thing we could do is maybe make some text blink. <laughs> they had lot, a good laugh about the fact that this ID is completely absurd. Uh, so the evening goes on, and Lou will meet his future wife. And the next morning, he arrives at, at work, just to realize that his colleague, you know, first-degree humor, John, and he realized that John went back to the office after the party just to implement, during the night, the best HTML tag ever. <laughs> so everything started as a non-documented uh, Easter egg. You know the end of that story. And I mean, if they had my opinion at that party, it could have been worse. So, we're making fun of this, but we've all used the blink tag, right? Liars. Um, and we, uh, back then, to attract the attention of people on banner ads to, you know, sell ads and, and stuff, it was one of the great ways to, to attract the attention. And lots of people also used the year afterwards Java applets to do so. And back then, it took around like, f from what I've heard, 30 seconds to load, just to make some text blinks, blink or scroll, etc. And it really upset Lou. He was like, can't we find a new solution for that? So he was really frustrated. And after insisting a month with his colleague, um, Scott Furman, responsible of the imaging and of Netscape, he convinced Lou to add an extension to the GIF format. GIF format? GIF? Yeah, GIF. Yeah, okay. Um, so he, he convinced him to add an extension to the GIF format. Um, and if you open any animated GIF right now, you will see a Netscape uh, application block, which is where you say how many times you want to loop on the frames. And you put zero for endless loop, of course. So if I talk so much about Lou, it's because, actually, he's the inventor of HTTP cookies. And back then, the web was pretty much stateless. So to implement a e-commerce website with a virtual card while still maintaining a user connected through multiple page refresh, you had to get up early. So that's the key reason why um, Lou uh, wanted to add some state inside the, the browser on the client side. So if we look at the patent of the cookies, we can see that inventor, Lou Montuli, original assignee, Netscape, current assignee. OK, next topic. Uh, <clears throat> so in my investigation, I, I got interested to several points of view. I mean, when you investigate a case, you have to listen to everyone, but the main one is the one of those who use cookies on their website. So are there any developers in the room? Yeah. OK, so that's the one we'll focus on. We'll ask uh, several questions and try to give them answers. I may explain lots of stuff you already know, but I mean, recaps are always good, right? And also present some new uh, stuff that arrived in, um, in the recent years about cookies. And we'll also cover stuff about tracking, etc. So first question, what is an HTTP cookie? So first, we're going to stop with the cookies for dummies definition, like it's a small file on my uh, computer, etc. No, it's a limited and dated definition, because, I mean, we've stopped putting one cookie in uh, per file like years ago. And also, it's not only a storing mechanism. It's more than that. I often like to describe cookies as a, a protocol, maybe, more. You know, like a, a behavior on which uh, browser and servers uh, got an agreement. And so I prefer to talk about it like that. The other thing is the definition, like, lots of people are mixing up cookies and sessions. So 
I, too often I see in project people saying, oh, I put that information in, in the cookies. So I look at the cookies. Okay, no, you, you stored the information inside the RAM of the server in a session. It's completely different. I know the, the confusion happened lots of time, but we really have to, to educate people to stop making that confusion. So small diagram, right? Okay, so a user wants to visit cookies.rocks. Okay, so he types the address, the browser makes an HTTP request to the server, and the server is like, okay, here come the, the HTML of the page. And then the subtle differences is that the server can say, hey, this is some information, set cookie, blah, blah, blah. And it is a key and a value, and yes, most of the time you use it for identifiers, but could be a language, uh, cho chosen by the user, could be a custom theme, etc. So with that, the browser actually has a cookie jar, and it's the actual name in the source of many browser, um, and it puts the cookie inside it. So the next time the user wants to go to cookies.rocks, the browser just has to look at the jar and, hmm, are there any cookies for this site? Yes. There is. So the browser will have to, that's the protocol, send those cookies in a different header, which is called cookie. Coo cookie, yeah. And here in our example, it's still like a, an ad identifier 42. And with that, the server will be able to give the, the HTML page and to contextualize it given the user. Cookies are nothing more than this. A protocol between servers and browsers allowing the storage of a state on the client side. Okay? The, so, I mean, for now, it's pretty simple recaps. This behavior, behavior has been invented by Lou in 1994. They had a document so other browsers could implement the same way. I mean, Back then, it was really useful. Then we had two official RFCs uh, in 1997 and, and two, 2000. Uh, but for the past 24 years, basically, the be general behavior hasn't changed much. It follows the same rules. And so once a browser receives a cookie, the first question is, how much time is it stored? And without any option, when a server says, set cookie, it's going to last for the end of the session, which is when the browser is closed. But the server has a way to say, okay, you can maybe with a set an expiration date, and this date is really important, with the attribute expires. So you can say, this cookie will expire at this date. We can also say, in this amount of seconds and with these attributes, you have to expire the cookie. Okay. Once a server has said that, does he have a way to delete the cookie? Not really. I would rather talk about the server has a way to ask for a de cookie deletion. Again, it's, it's a protocol, so, and because it's not stored on the server, it's more about asking a for a deletion. So for that, sorry, uh, at first, I was like, hmm, there must be a remove cookie header or a delete cookie header. Yeah? No. It would be too easy. So the mechanism is to use a date, uh, to use expire, and a date in the past. I mean, why not? Uh, most of the people are using the uh, reference epoch date, so January 1st, 1970. 1970. You can also use max age with a value of zero. It was added in, a, in the second RFC, and it's not supported by uh, old versions of IE, but who still uses IE? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so for now, things are simple. Recaps, no surprises, no traps, okay. But since the beginning of the talk, I've been saying, when the user goes back to the site, to the same site, but what does it mean? I mean, clearly those two URLs are different websites. That's obvious. But how does the browser know? And that's actually the main problem with cookies. All security holes and problems we often, all traps we all fell into, 
are related to the fact that the rules that say if a cookie needs to be sent or not are not always that clear. So the question is, when does a browser say, oh, we'll automatically send the cookies to the server? And for that, we have to look carefully at what a, a URL is. So on a URL, we have a protocol. Okay, We have a host, a port, and a path. Protocol, host, port, path. OK. And the question will be, to, to say if two URLs are the same site, there will be some rules to, that apply on different parts of this URL. And the first problematic attribute with cookies is, is domain. So I should be able to do a demo, but without internet, it's going to be a problem. So I'll just try to cut it and do it again. But basically, what I'll try is to go to a website and set up a few cookies, so those ones. One cookie without the attribute, one with the attribute domain equals cookies.rocks, and, uh, and two with blue.cookies.rocks, so those ones. So let's try. So that's my demo website. I had to buy a DNS uh, domain for this, so if you want to finance my project, don't hesitate. And if we want to finance my data plan, too, you know? OK. That's going to be problematic. Yeah, I, I'm on, yeah. It's going to be a problem with that, but uh, I'll try. Sorry. So when you're focusing and the demo doesn't work, you have to sing. Second pro tip of speakers. If you're going to London. OK, let's try again. Oh, OK, great. I'll have to switch back afterwards or, yeah, don't worry. It's going to be OK. So I'm going to this page. So this page just did this. It said four cookies. So the f we are on the website cookies.works. Those are the cookies the server received and that were sent back. So. The first one was stored, OK. Second one was stored, OK. But basically, if you're on cookies.rocks and you say domain equals cookies.rocks, should be the same as not saying anything, right? Trap again. I mean, the difference is one pixel, or maybe, sorry, nine pixel in HD. But yeah. The difference is here, this dot. And at first, I, I, I was like, hmm, maybe uh, precising the, the domain will say, hey, this cookie is only for cookies that works. No. When you say that, you're just augmenting the, the range, expanding the range on which the cookies will match. So you should, most of the time, not use this attribute. So let me show you. Yeah, now I have to switch back the Wi-Fi, but it's going to be OK at some point. Yeah. So I was saying the domain increases the range of the cookie to all hosts that end with the value. So if we take an example, sorry. Okay. If we take an example here, if I don't set the attribute, only the first request will be sent with the cookies. So right now we're on blue cookies works. Okay, so same host, and uh, the request goes with the cookie. If you send the attribute to blue dot cookies works, you're expanding it. So even big dot cookie blue dot cookies works will send the cookie too. So you're really expanding. So maybe if we just said cookies.rocks, huh, we are expanding even more to everything that ends up with cookies.rocks, right? So what happens if we just do rocks? Domain equals works. Could we, could we set a cookie for every site that ends with works or .com or? No, and it's a good thing. So basically, uh, 
the idea is that it's going to be okay. Yeah, is that uh, on your domain, on your host, you have the TLD, the domain, and the subdomain. And so often we talk about TLDs, but so here, uh, here, sorry. But what happened? How would you define a TLD? You're like, hmm, everything after the last dot, right? But here in the UK, so there are two dots. Hmm. Okay, so if it's .co.uk, the TLD is two dots. What about Tokyo.jp? Hmm. It's not that simple, and it's actually a problem. In my investigation, I found, I found, sorry, uh, a few bugs, issue tickets in the bug tracker of Mozilla. So this one is saying, what do we do with .co.uk? Because right now we can set cookies for every website. And I say set cookies, but it could be um, rewrite cookies or, may, or even read them. So the discussion went from this to maybe we need to have more knowledge about domains in general to browsers. And maybe we need just a, an effective top-level domain uh, list. So this arrived on Mozilla at first, and right now it's on this website. So the public suffix.org list. And it's actually a really interesting list. Uh, it's even um, mentioned in the third, uh, the latest RFC on, on cookies. It says, you, if you implement a browser and use cookies, you have to use that list. So if we look at the sources of Mozilla Firefox, they are using the list to secure cookies. If we look at Chrome sources, they are using the list. If we look at um, Safari, uh, WebKit sources, they are using a library which uses the list. If we look at the source of Edge, anyway, so in that list, here's an extract. You'll see, uh, as I said, .co.uk, .tokyo.jp, etc. But more interestingly, you have private stuff in that list. Because, I mean, it would be a problem if on myname.github.io I could define cookies for other persons, right? So in that list, there are actually lots of private prefixes like this. So for AWS, Azure, etc., and of course, on Clever Cloud too. So <coughs> what, what's really great is that Browser don't really talk about TLD to define if you can set a cookie, but really stop at the public suffix uh, part. Okay? Okay. So just small tip about that. Uh, you can't set cookies with domain equals localhost for the same reason, but um, it's not in the list, but you, you still can't do that, so be careful. Uh, second attribute, not much traps here, uh, so the, the path, you can set it at a few values. Here, if I don't set anything, any path would match. If I set slash API, hmm, small trap, because even if slash API dash FAQ starts with this path, it won't match. That's the small trick about this. And even if you do API dash something, it, it's actually, it restricts the range of the cookie to the path that starts with the value plus a slash. I mean, crazy, right? Anyway, so, um, sorry. Okay, it's gonna be okay. Yeah, the, um, right now, If I'm on HTTPS cookies.rocks and I set a cookie, it will be sent even if I go to the website on a non-secure URL. So that's a problem, right? If you're on a public Wi-Fi, you know, famous brand of coffee offering Wi-Fi, they must be really, really, I mean, um, friendly to offer free Wi-Fi, yeah. Yeah, maybe they are doing stuff on non-secure HTTP or, or not. We don't really know, but the fact that cookies could be sent over a non-secure channel is a problem. So we have the secure attribute to prevent that. Who has ever heard of the secure attribute? Yeah. 
nice. Um, so this is one of the attributes you should, I, was, I, I would say, you should use all the time. Uh, especially, you should use HTTPS, of course. But with this attribute, if you set a cookie, it won't be sent over clear channels by your browser. And that's pretty nice. The other possibility to do that, so it restricts the range of the cookie to secure request. The other possibility you could have is to, uh, to force uh, the, the browser to never go to HTTP non-secured. And with this header, you, you have the possibility to do that. So the idea is that the server with this header says to the browser, man, HTTP non-secured, it's finished between us, OK? It's only HTTPS from now on. So the browser will store that information. And even if you type a, a non-secured URL, if you click on a link that is not secured, etc., it will be automatically uh, uh, the re redirection will be done inside the browser, so nothing will be sent over a clear channel. Um, that's not a header you should add like, oh, I saw this header at DevOps UK, let's add it. No, it's not that simple, so I would advise you to read the OWASP uh, website before doing anything, because you can fall into a few traps, so please read that carefully before. Um, the other thing is that if you're on cookies.rocks non-secured, look at the top, the problem is you'll be able to set cookies even if you're on that page. So if I go to that page, I could set some uh, cookies that are secured and potentially overwrite the secure cookies. And that's a problem. For this, we have new stuff in cookies in 20, 2016, 2017. So it has been implemented in Chrome and Firefox. And I would say Safari should be arriving, maybe, we don't really know, but I could bet on that if you want afterwards. But basically, the, this uh, IRC draft is saying maybe we should never allow a non-secured website to set secure cookies. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the other thing is that when the server receives cookies, it only receives the key and the value. It doesn't know anything about the attributes. So how can he know that this cookie was sent of a secure channel was set with the domain and attribute. It, it can't really know that. And again, some new stuff around cookies. So that's a new draft that's going to overwrite the latest one from 2011 that's uh, currently ongoing, which defines a new stuff called cookie prefix. So the idea of a cookie prefix, it's a bit of a hack because, I mean, we can't say hey, let's, uh, let's use a, a new header for cookies. Uh, everyone is ready? Uh, everybody changes the server like in two weeks? Right now, no. You, you can't do that on the web. It's too complicated. So the idea was to add some prefix, and there are two of them. So the first one is underscore underscore secure. And if your cookie starts with that, so here, underscore underscore secure dash ID equals 42, the browser will only uh, save this cookie if it has the secure attribute. So now, when the, sorry, when the server receives the cookie, it only receives the key and the value, but the key starts with underscore underscore secure. So the server is like, oh, if I receive that, that means the browser, browser is um, uh, obligated to, to have stored that if it came from a secure origin with a secure attribute. Yeah, but only a, on browser that implements that. So for now, it's a first step, but while we are waiting for browser to implement this, on the server side, you can't really be sure that it's fully secured. That's for now, a, a problem, so we'll, we'll have to wait. The other prefix is underscore underscore host, and it's even more, you know, uh, tight and secured. 
the rules are the browser will only save this cookie if it has the secure attribute, if the URL is secured, if the path is slash, and if there's no domain. Because as I've said, most of the time you shouldn't be setting a domain because it expands the range of the cookie. So that prefix is pretty nice. You can set it right now, and on browser that don't support it, we'll just work as it has been working for many years. So it's, it's OK. Um, so about this, we, I've, shown, sorry, I've shown stuff about the protocol, HTTPS, HTTP, with the secure attributes. We saw with the domain attributes how we can we can maybe tackle a bit the problem of the host and the TLD, etc. We talk about the path, but what about the port? Is there a check on the port? Yeah? No. And that's one of the problems. Because in the browser, you have a, what we call the same origin policy. Have you heard of the same origin policy? Yeah. So it's a rule inside browser to define if two uh, websites can trust each other. And we call uh, an or wh what is an origin? So an origin is the combination of those values. So if two pages have the same protocol, same host, full host, and port, it's the same origin. And the problem is cookies are checked on those, on those, yeah. And it's, I would say, the only API uh, cookies, I mean, in the browser that is checked around those combination and not the origin combination. And that's, that's a bit of a problem. So I have a problem with my second laptop. OK. And so right now, people are trying to, sorry, to define a way to make cookies really adapt the, the same origin policy, but they can't really find a good way to do it. So the proposition at first was to say, maybe we should change the name of the, ad of the, ad uh, the header and change maybe from set cookie and cookie to origin cookie and set origin cookie. But as I said, you can't really tell to the whole web to just uh, change the headers, so that's a bit of a problem. OK, it's going to be OK. Don't stress, Hubert. Wi-Fi is doing stuff you don't like, but it's going to end up OK. Sorry. So as I was saying, um, when you go back to a website, the cookie, the browser will do um, a request, OK? You send a response. You're now on example-foo.com, uh, another domain I had to buy for this demo. Anyway, um, if you're on that website and there is an image on another site, maybe like an image on cookie.crux, foo.jpg, what does the browser do? It says, are there any cookies for cookie cookies.rocks? Yes, they are. So I will send them. And is it OK? Or at least, even if you say yes or no, that's what, I've, that's what the web has, has been doing for 24 years. And that's the classic behavior of, coo of cookies. And that's the beginning of some attacks and some problems. And so they are called the cross, uh, cross site request forgery, so CSRF or XSRF attacks. So let's do a, a small demo. So I don't have my second laptop, but I should be able to have the web to do some demos, which is better for you, not for me. Anyway, so if I go here, I can set my profile. So maybe my name is Uber. I just, men I just have to mention my name as an H and a T. It's really important. OK. If I go to examplefoo.com, hmm, 
very interesting website. Maybe I want to click on some links. And if I click on, hmm, of course I want to, to become rich while doing nothing. Why wouldn't I? So let's click on this. Uh, let's click on the page, but here I, I should click on that button, right? Okay. I'm going to click on it. Okay, so now my session everywhere has been re rewritten. So what happened? I, I, I said my first name was Uber and my last name was Sabloni, and now, now I, I am, you are not rich. What happened? So basically, if I go back on that website uh, in network, sorry, it's in French anyway, um, if I click here, actually the browser, the, the website I wrote to do a CSRF attack, did a post on update profile on cookies.rocks while I was on another website. And so what did the browser do? It just sent the cookies. And so cookies.rocks thought I was authenticated and accepted the update profile. That's clearly a really dumb and simple CSRF attack. If you are vulnerable to this, okay, but you sh normally you shouldn't. We, we have lots of toolings, uh, client side and server side, trying to help us prevent that. We have, uh, if you're doing server side rendering, we have CSRF token stuff. If you are doing uh, client side like Angular, etc., we have also s lots of techniques. But this is at the root of the problem of cookies. So I could do a whole talk on that. You should look at the OWASP website. But what's nice is that in the new draft, we have an interesting way to fight those attacks. We have a new attribute, which is called same site. Um, yeah. Which is called same site. And what is... is what is interesting with that attribute is that you'll be able to say, I'm giving you that cookie, but if, you're an, if you are on another page, don't send the cookie, just like I, I tried to do. So, so there are two values, lax and strict. The rules are a bit complicated to explain just right now, but look at some articles I could tweet after it. It's really interesting, especially strict, because if you said strict, it's like you are on a example-foo.com, you click on a link to Facebook, you arrive on a landing page of Facebook not authenticated while you were already authenticated. So even when you do a, just a, a navigation, you wouldn't send the cookie, so it's really strict. But this is really, really interesting. You shouldn't stop using the old techniques because for now it's only in Chrome and Firefox since Tuesday, so it's really, uh, you know, it's the right week. Um, but it's a really interesting attribute, and you can already set it now for even for a browser that don't support it. So who can read cookies? We, we've set lots of cookies. Who can read them? Well, very friendly people offering us free Wi-Fi, of course, but also JavaScript with the craziest web API ever, document.cookies. So if I go on my, um, my demo on cookies.rocks, uh, maybe I can set lots of cookies. If I open a console and I do document.cookie, so let's do this. Yeah, okay. If I do, hmm, maybe I want to delete all the cookies, so what should I do? Maybe set it to empty string, right? Okay, seems to work. Didn't work. Hmm. But if I do foo equals bar, it has an impact. Uh, if you, sorry, if you look at the end uh, here, foo.bar was accepted. And what's really crazy about this API is that it's not a property on the document object, it's more of a getter setter. If you set a value on document.cookies, you're actually just behaving like the set cookie header. And if you get information from document.cookie, it's a bit like the cookie header, the browser, the one the browser sends. 
Why? I don't know. But that's why everyone is using wrappers in Angular, uh, React, and stuff around document but cookies. And I would advise not to use it by hand. I mean, if you want to delete stuff, you have to do this, like foo equals bar, um, max age equals zero. OK. Hmm, I have deleted the cookie. I mean, how crazy that is that? Anyway, so uh, the fact that you can read cookies with JavaScript is at the root of another type of attack, cross-site scripting attack. We don't say CSS because it's another thing, and we love CSS, of course. But XSS are a kind of attack that use the fact that any script in your page, so your script should be OK. The scripts you downloaded from NPM, they should be OK, because you obviously have a, a, you pay a service that gives you notification when there are vulnerabil vulnerabilities, of course. And if you are on a non-secured website, yeah, we've all been to airports. Hey, the airport injected my flight uh, time in a website it doesn't know. That's really useful. No, that's creepy. Anyway, so I could talk about um, XSS attacks for very long. That's a really deep subject. Again, read this page, talk with professionals, hire them. It's really important for security. We have lots of ways to prevent them, but knowing how they work is really, really important. Um, so I have a last demo because seems that when I speak French, uh, English, I'm a bit slower than when I speak French. It's going to be OK. It doesn't want to. It does want to. Sorry about that, people. Yeah. OK, let's stop to try to make it happen. Breathe deeply, sing, if you're going to San Francisco. OK. Um, as I was saying, there are lots of ways to prevent XSS attacks. There are CSP headers. Look at them. It, again, we could do a whole talk about that. There's a really interesting attribute, which is called uh, HTTP only. If you set a cookie with HTTP only, you are saying to the browser, OK, I'm giving you that cookie. But don't give it to JavaScript, OK? That's ba basically the gist. And so that way, with document.cookie, you won't be able to read those values. But the browser will still honor the protocol. And if you go to a website that has cookies, it will send them. So that's pretty nice. So we saw lots of attributes. That's a bit uh, long and boring. But with those, you have all the knowledge you need about cookies. I have a demo normally. Yeah, I have stuff to pass. I'm sorry. But I can't see what I'm doing, so you'll have to see. Yeah, OK. So the last point of view I want to end with is the point of view of those who want No, uh, sorry. <laughs> those who want to mm -hmm, improve the user experience on their website, obviously. And so when you want to do that, when you want to track people, le the first problem is that for the same reason uh, there are some CSRF attacks. I mean, if you go to foo.com and there's a request to another site, the cookies will, will go with them. So that's a demo you can play with at home because I bought example.foo, example.bar. OK, so let's clear the cookies. OK, I'm not connected anymore to anything. And if I visit those very interesting pages, so maybe the sex position foo, and hmm, maybe I have a, a really important disease and I don't want people to hear about it, on those two pages, there is an image. Of course, this image is on, whoa, big zoom, on cookies.rocks, obviously. 
sorry. So it's here. I'm gonna yeah. So the image is on cookies.rocks. And so it went with a cookie. So what happens if I close those two tabs and I go to a, another website? I mean, Mr. Zuckerberg, if I close the Facebook tab, will I still be tracked? <laughs> well, Senator, I'll have my team. Yes, the answer is yes. OK, so let's go here. Sorry, I misclicked here. And we even have the time where I reloaded the page to show you the dev tools. I went to sex position on example foo, I went on disease on bar, and I reloaded the sex position on foo. That's just that simple. And if you build the demo yourself like I just did, you're like, hey, um, I feel a bit dirty, but it's really simple to do that. So there's a lot of ways to block that. Uh, those kind of cookies are called third-party cookies because there are cookies sent when the URL in the browser address is not the same as the request. So I was on example foo, but the request went to cookies.rocks. So it's a third-party cookies. And that, that's basically what uh, advertisers are using. So what happens if I go here? So I downloaded a Firefox in English just for you, but I forgot to start it. So you'll have to trust me. I'm blocking, hmm, blocking cookies. No, it's not that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, blocking cookies. So maybe if I go back to foo and bar, that won't work, right? So let's clear the cookies. Let's open cookies.rocks. No history, as you can see, okay? So if I visit those two pages, it won't work. Okay, good. Hmm. But if I visit other pages, what, hap wh what will happen? If I visit maybe Fu is the worst actor of Hollywood, and maybe I really want to vote for the bar party. I mean, their political stance are awesome. If I go on this page and I reload, hmm, I'm still tracked. Why? Because basically, cookies are just one of the storage facilities you have in a browser to, to, to store stuff, and it's meant to do that. But on images, you have cache headers, e-tag headers. There's lots of ways where your browser is storing information for good reasons that could be hacked to track you. I talked uh, earlier about HSTS uh, headers, where a server can say, hey, brother, between us, it's HTTPS only. The browser has to store that information. And believe it or not, a really famous French company used that for three years to track people before um, Safari blocked them in November, if I'm correct. So that's a pretty big mess. I'm going to end with the two minutes, sorry, with the conclusion. Sorry. So you're not supposed to see that because my tooling should work, but thanks to Orange, I don't have a Wi-Fi. Anyway, um, so if we, if we go back to, uh, to, uh, to 2018, I mean, we've been complaining about cookies for, for 24 years now. We've been saying, oh, they, they are tracking us, and, and it's a problem. There are lots of technical security holes, but would the web still be there or at least how would the web have become if we didn't have really annoying, you know, blinking text, Java ads, etc.? Would we still have that kind of World Wide Web? It spread because we had free contents as users and revenues from ads as, as companies. So I'm not saying I love ads, nobody loves them, but the web really grows thanks to that. So 
that really raised the question on how, what do we want to, for the, the future. So, even my remote is off, anyway. So, even that is broken. Shouldn't be. <sighs> okay. Wow. That was a lot of facts, Watson, right? Yes, indeed. But now, John, we can identify what happens with cookies. We know about the rules, we know about where to find information on how to prevent stacks. Essentially, we know when it stinks, you know? And we should spread the knowledge. We had a small demo around tracking, but there are many ways to track people, and I think we should spread the knowledge with our family and friends muggles, you know, explain them how it works, and basically it's really simple. And I would also say, Watson, that we must debate about the future of the web. I mean, between having lots of stuff for free, not paying, and blocking every third-party cookies, trackers, ads, etc., at one point we'll have to choose, sadly. And I think we Again, it's Sherlock speaking. We, we have to debate as a society what kind of future we want. So maybe we want more uh, subscription stuff on, on uh, articles of newspapers, etc. That's really a debate I want you to have this weekend with your family, etc. Thank you very much. <laughs>